Hey everyone, uh, my name is Victor Hammond. I am here today for Education 525 Collaborative Classrooms and Schools. I'm giving a presentation over my dream classroom and what it would look like. Um, so I am looking to have a very uh, collaborative classroom that is highly student-centered. Um, and I'm looking to generate a form of camaraderie with the students so that there is a lot of student to student interaction as well as teacher to student interaction. That's kind of my main goals. With that being said, I'm going to go ahead and begin here and start looking into this now. Um, just kind of give you an introduction and a demographics to the classroom. The goal of the classroom here, um, I set myself a little precedent here, is the fact that I'm going to be shopping directly from Amazon.com for all of my supplies. Um, I like it very streamlined. It's easy how things can be delivered right to the door or even to the classroom or to the school. Um, it makes it easier. I also want to give you guys a setting of the school and what it truly looks like. The setting of the school is a suburban or rural, medium-sized uh, public high school. It's got about uh, 500 to 600 students, and they are on a one-to-one -one learning capability um, with an Apple program, which uh, they're able to use MacBooks, um, and there will be a slow transition here in the next year or so toward using iPads. Um, the ethnicity at this school um, is majority white, and there's an approximate 10% minority population um, in that case. As well, uh, there is a small population for special education, and they are inclusive in all matters. Um, there is no exclusion to special education, students with IEPs, um, students who have uh, special needs in the classroom. Um, so that's how it works. The class that I would be teaching and the size of it is going to be uh, U.S. government and economics. It's a junior or senior level um, course, or courses, excuse me. Um, and there's approximately 30 students in each of those classes. Um, the way the school works is they run on a block schedule. So these blocks are 85 minutes a day. Um, so they are very uh, long. Um, so we want to make sure that it is um, primarily comfortable for the students in that 85 minutes that you're spending a day, um, as well as uh, it being a productive classroom in addition to their comfort. Again, it is composed primarily of seniors, and there's a couple of juniors um, with the intentions to graduate early. And I, out of the entire school of some 500 to 600 students, am the only physical government economics teacher in the building. Um, there are a couple of virtual students that uh, are available that some of them are able to do online learning with it. But I am technically the only person for U.S. government and economics that teaches that discipline. We look at the classroom dimensions, what it looks like is the size of the classroom is approximately 20 feet by 35 feet long. Um, the walls are composed of concrete block with a very uh, boring gray paint is what I like to call it. Uh, the floor is very flat carpet, industrial carpet um, with a concrete underside, so there's no padding on it either, so it's kind of hard if you're laying on the ground. Uh, there are cupboards and cabinets available. There are 12 individual cupboards with shelves for storage. They are lockable too, which is helpful. The counter is a single running counter along the west wall of the classroom, and it is very flush with the wall. And then there is a chalkboard uh, or a whiteboard in, in this case. We don't have uh, any chalkboards anymore. Um, the whiteboard would consist of the entire wall from floor to ceiling uh, for dry erase use, um, and it can be you can use dry erase markers on any part of that wall specific to it. There's some little changes I would make to the classroom in terms of its bones or its, its infrastructure. Um, the first thing I would want to do is change the lighting. Um, I would think that the concept of a fluorescent light bulb um, and having four different settings on it is not effective for student learning, especially with students with light sensitivities, um, especially for uh, showing movies and films in the classroom and for student comfort. Um, that's what it boils down to. So the way I would change that is to establish multicolored light, changing light bulbs for the classroom. Uh, the teacher is able to set the settings for those bulbs um, to the certain color that they are looking for for that student comfort. And that would be operated through a Bluetooth app on the phone through those smart bulbs. The chalkboard, as I talked about in the previous slide, uh, the the whiteboard rather instead of a chalkboard, um, there is, as you can see here in this image below, 
a um, wall paint for that so you can write on that dry erase wall specifically. So you were, yeah, writing on the walls, um, which is kind of fun because that's not something that was encouraged when you were a kid. Uh, you definitely didn't want to take a dry erase marker to mom and dad's wall, but here we are today. Um, especially in the high school setting, we know that students are a little bit more mature than to be writing on the walls. So this is where that change would then take place um, and students are able to use that. As well, it, it incorporates an area to use the entire wall to use your space to your advantage. Um, that is also very conducive to UDL learning and to project-based learning in the case of where we are creating connective webs. Um, we are making connections to different things or if we have certain assignments that are coming up, announcements to be made or other items that would be pertinent to using dry erase markers in a dry erase wall. In terms of teachers' items, um, it's kind of unique. Um, it's very different. Our classroom is different in the 21st century in, in the era of COVID and uh, 2021, you know, uh, having a brighter outlook. I think some changes need to be made. Um, the teacher does not assume any of an authoritarian role as much as they did unless it's absolutely necessary for behavioral issues. Um, the teacher should be looked as more of a learning coach instead of a teacher. Um, I view that to be very specific, um, and it establishes relationships with the students more than any before. Um, and I think that's extremely effective. So with that being said, um, I'm going to go out and say it, that the teacher does not have a desk. Uh, there is no desk for the uh, instructor to be around. And the reason why I do that is because I, I like to call it a crutch. Um, students <clears throat> uh, and teachers, rather, um, like to hide behind their desks um, often and, and assume that authoritarian role and demand respect uh, from being behind that desk and being in that comfort zone. Um, and and if, in the 21st century, if you want to experience growth, if you want to experience learning, you have to experience discomfort. Um, I think that's a very effective way for learning, um, and you have to experience failure in order to see that growth happen. Um, and I think this is a very way, if we are going to practice what we preach as teachers, as instructors, then we need to assume that role of a learning coach, and we need to uh, become a little bit uncomfortable um, when it comes to the idea of having a universal design classroom. Um, the teacher has no desks in the sense that it is creating a more collaborative classroom in that way. <clears throat> as well, in terms of technology, um, there is a smart projector that would be atop of the whiteboard wall. The reason why I did it against the whiteboard wall instead of any other wall is so that um, the uh, instructor or learning coach or even the students are able to project a screen of what they're looking for um, and then they can with the dry erase board markers or whatever else they're looking at they are able to draw specifically on that without making changes specifically to the document or specifically to the computer screen so I think that is a very easy way to uh, effectively do that as well, it establishes a clean area, um, so it allows for decorations upon other walls um, instead of having projectors in a different way. And the classroom directions, we always know the point of emphasis is on the dry erase wall. That establishes that leadership uh, mentality there, and it, it shows students a form of direction if they're looking for instruction. Um, Apple TV would be very effective, as I said earlier in the uh, in the PowerPoint, that we are using uh, MacBooks, which are very effective, and over time we would be transitioning to iPads. Apple TVs would be very effective because of their easy use of AirPlay um, through the computer screen. So if there was a student that was going to present over something, it would be easy for them to click on the screen mirroring tool and establish that AirPlay so they can project on the screen at any point in time, which is very effective. As well, Apple TV can be used for um, Applications such as uh, Netflix, Hulu, uh, SiriusXM, Apple iTunes, um, other items that would be very, very helpful for the classroom and to establish student learning um, effectively. There would also be a lectern at the front, um, a steel podium. You can see that uh, up at the top right here where a lectern is effective for presentations um, to show the student about um, how to effectively use the lectern and not 
abuse it basically. Um, so if they are giving a presentation, they are permitted to use that lectern as a way for them to um, check their notes and present and, and know proper etiquette of communication um, and effective speaking and listening. As well, there would be a wood stool. Um, as a teacher, sometimes you need to take a little break up at the front and be a little bit more relaxed. And I think a bar stool uh, or a bar finish stool is very effective for that matter. Um, it's not specifically sitting down to where students can't see you, but it is at an elevated length. So that'll be effective for them as well. In terms of student workstations, this is where we can really start to get creative and unique in my sense. Um, and, uh, excuse me, uh, incorporate elements of universal design for learning in here. In this sense, I want to look at adjustable height desks. We all know that students have different heights, different sizes. Um, we know that they come in different shapes, right? And we know that some students prefer to stand, they prefer to sit. There are other ways uh, to do that. And with that being said, I wanted to incorporate an adjustable height desk. Um, so as you can see here on the bottom right corner here, this is an adjustable height. It has a crank on it to where the student can raise or lower that desk according to which way they feel the most comfortable with. Um, we have kids ranging anywhere from 4 foot 11 to 6 foot 7. Um, and obviously that 2 to 3 feet of difference um, is going to make the difference between a comfortable classroom and an uncomfortable classroom. Um, and so this is where I really wanted to implement that. As well, you can see in the top of that uh, screen there, there is also a little hole uh, sticking out from the top here that you can see. Um, that would be allowed for an outlet to come through if you're looking for a computer charger or a phone charger for that student. That's where that outlet can go through without having to snake the cord around the desk so much. I would uh, incorporate about 24 of them because they are somewhat personalized desks. As well, uh, I look to incorporate kneeling chairs. You can see here in the middle image, um, an ergonomic kneeling chair. This is where the students uh, tend to become very relaxed in the classroom. They tend to put their feet up upon their uh, normal chairs, and this is where I think it's ineffective. Um, if we want students to learn proper posture, proper sitting, um, and to work on their core specifically, um, and to have some sort of exercise throughout the day and to be active in their learning, um, this ergonomic kneeling chair would be very effective. Um, it promotes proper posture, it promotes the sense of kneeling, um, and it would help the students in terms of their comfort as well. I would also incorporate a 24 outlet power strip. I'd probably want about two of those. Um, that is for um, chargers. We know throughout the day, uh, towards the afternoon, students' uh, juice on their computers, like a, what, or what I like to call them, uh, their juice on their computers starts to wear out. And so this is where I would incorporate those uh, 24 outlet power strips is so that every student has access then to those chargers and they are able to be comfortable in their desk, in their workstation, and also allow for them to charge their computers at the same time without uh, being inconvenienced with moving or having their collaborative uh, cohort moving as well. Of course, last but not least, you want to incorporate an office or a desk chair. Um, I love the idea of having a mesh back desk chair that is somewhat comfortable and padded at the bottom, as well as having um, some arms on the side. As you can see with this one here, it looks like it's very comfortable and it's something that could actually be rocked back and forth. Students love to rock their chairs. I'm actually kind of doing it right now. Uh, they like to rock their chairs back and forth. And I think that is very uh, conducive to learning, and I think that should not be ever hindered. Um, the way that this chair works is it would not allow for students to fall back on the chair so that all four of those minor legs would be remaining on the ground, and they are able to rock it back and forth from there. The student collaboration area. This is where we really get unique. It starts to look more like a living room than a classroom, and uh, often I would get I think I would probably get comments about how, oh, is this student being productive if they are laying on this couch? Well, I, I believe so. Um, and when I say that, I'm looking at this sofa sectional type area with a couple of chairs. Um, this allows for students to be a little bit more comfortable in the environment, and it promotes a, a more comfortable living space. Um, and, and for students to uh, relate to each other and to collaborate as well. 
Um, when you look at a home, you look at the family room, you look at uh, how that works. That you don't have, you don't tend to have desks and chairs uh, in that family room, right? You want your uh, family to be comfortable, and you want them to be able to talk about their feelings, talk about what's going on, um, and discuss and have fun in that area. And this is where I'm looking at that specifically, um, and this is what I'm looking for to have a nice. Um, an area rug, a sectional area with chairs, and to have uh, a couple of lamps that would help uh, facilitate that comfortable environment, students encouraging uh, this form of comfort. So the black slides indicate a new, uh, excuse me, they incorporate a new slides or edits that I made. And these are additions rather than edits. Um, and here's how I would do this. When I look at the form of curriculum, I think if we are going to change the class or if we are going to change to a collaborative environment, we need to be switching over from a A, B, C, D, F format um, and a, a, a simple grading scale and a grade book to be different than that. Um, if we're going to actually take this student-centered approach to learning and we're going to create a, a collaborative learning environment and a personalized learning environment and a project-based learning environment, we really, really have to switch the mentality of how our grading works, how our curriculum works, how our lessons plan works, or lesson plans work, excuse me. And the, the seminars, I believe, are a great way to do that. Uh, seminars, as I see them, are uh, interesting topics that a student would want to do. And it also is going to provide depth of knowledge and details to the specific curriculum and standard uh, that is funded by the state. These seminars uh, provide the depth of knowledge um, through instructor-led seminars or through student-led seminars. Um, this is where we really start to dive into a student-centered approach to learning in the sense that if there's a student that is interested in teaching a course over a specific subject that they are passionate about, they are able to do that. Um, if a student comes to an instructor or a learning coach um, to teach a seminar over student interest or something that they are interested in and they want to know more about, they are welcome to do that too. Um, regardless, we are incorporating with these seminars, instead of just teaching lessons week by week, we are doing a all week long, uh, term long, nine weeks long, um, student interest um, based learning. It is student centered in that sense because we are catering to their interests. And we are also bending the rules to the general state standards of what is being written up on the board. Um, this, I think, is very, very effective. With that being said, you don't really want to have nine week long. Uh, courses over a specific subject sometimes, and this is where we can shrink them down to what we would refer to as workshops. These would be um, based upon uh, how long that is going to be. They can last a single day, they can last multiple days, they can last just an 85 minute block if they wanted to. Um, it is depending, or excuse me, depending on whether or not that student is truly interested or if it is an extendable uh, workshop for that period of time. As well, the student progression uh, in the classroom for curriculum is based upon their effort in the course and the grades that they receive. Um, and they receive these through collaborative work with other students, um, collaborative work in the seminars, collaborative work in the workshops, and collaborative work in the general classroom. It is based upon their individual work that they do by themselves. Um, and it's based upon student interest and passions. And this is where we really, really start to generate a student-centered approach to learning, is that the student interests are taking a priority over that of state standards, over that of what the teacher wants to instruct. Um, and this is where students actually start to get into their learning and to discover more details about what they want to know for the future. And this establishes a real-world situation. This establishes a real-world scenario. Um, and we know that the student can be an expert in a single topic than in the sense of being a generalized understanding in many topics. Um, and, and, and with a history background, being a history major, being a history teacher, 
I would rather my students take an entire course over, uh, as I'm teaching right now in a seminar, I would rather my students be an expert in the era of Hitler and Nazi Germany than for them to cover an entire world history course of 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 years um, in an 18-week class. Instead, they are condensing down to a nine-week class. They are studying something very, very specific to history, um, and they are examining detailed, detailed information, primary, secondary sources, and there is a lot more depth of knowledge that the student gets in there. And in that sense, I am generating a, a, a group of smaller historians in that sense. Um, and it could be the same applied to biology. It could be the same applied to earth and space science. It could be the same applied to English disciplines, um, where students can really dive into depth of knowledge. As well, students can design their own work day or school day. And it depends on their progress, is what I would be theorizing. Um, and their uh, work day would be dependent on how their progression is uh, during that school day. Um, in that sense, they are able to take command of their own learning. This is totally student-centered in that way. Um, the teacher necessarily takes a back seat role. Um, they don't necessarily actively communicate teaching, but they rather advise the student on what is going on. And with that being said, again, as I have told you earlier, is that we have to get away from the A, B, C, D, F format of grading. And how this would work is through a grading scale of 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and 0. It is very effective for student learning in the sense that um, they, are, they have a very great understanding of what a 5 out of 5 means and a 100% work means, going above and beyond the requirements. They know what a 4 means, right? That's 80%. They know that that is B work, it is okay work, it's effective for student learning, but it is not up to par of going above and beyond. They just hit the standard. Uh, three grade is slightly below the standard, um, but it is constituting enough to generate uh, an understanding of that grade. A two, a one, or a zero are, are not effective learning methods. And the expectation of the students are a three out of five or better in terms of that. So they are hitting the benchmark or they are exceeding the benchmark. Twos, ones, and zeros do not factor into grading. Um, and we have the demand of our students being held to a high standard in a collaborative classroom uh, and in personalized learning to gain at least a three or better on those certain assignments. And the grades only would figure into the work that has been completed. There are no missing assignments, or there are no deadlines, or there are no zeros accepted in the classroom, because that promotes student laziness. It does not promote effective work ethics in that sense. And so this is where we see the idea where students can always correct or redo the assignments to get a higher score, to either meet the benchmark or to exceed the benchmark, or to go above and beyond the benchmark of what it is required of them. This is where we are really generating a higher level of thinking than in a traditional classroom. Students also understand that we don't have an 89 out of 100, and they want to see what they can do to bump it up to a 90. You have a 5, which is 100%, a 4, which is 90%, a 3, which is a 60%, and anything below a 60%, or a D minus, if you would refer to it as that, is not effective for learning. That is not the standard of which we want them to perform at. So we hold, as instructors, as learning coaches, we hold the students more accountable for their learning. We hold students at a higher demand for their learning. And this is where we really start to see a student-centered classroom with a project-based learning approach in a personalized learning setting, incorporating elements of universal design for learning because of that student-centered approach this is where we really start to see effective learning take place. And the depth of knowledge of those students and the detailed knowledge of those students are very conducive to 21st century learning in the sense that they have collaboration, in the sense that they have critical thinking, in the sense that they are doing rigorous academic work, 
that is preparing them to become great, responsible, and productive citizens of the 21st century. Something fun I also decided to include, too, was a classroom pet. Um, I know this sounds weird, and I know this may not be something that everybody uh, agrees with in a way, especially with being a social studies teacher and not a science teacher. Um, I think a classroom pet is extremely important to the classroom, and I'm not saying that all teachers uh, or instructors need to have one, um, but the occasional awesome teacher too can certainly have one. This classroom pet, uh, what I would like to have personally through a grant process would be a leopard gecko. And what this is, is a very small animal. It's a hypoallergenic uh, amphibious animal that is very harmless towards others. Um, what a classroom pet does, as I have seen um, in other science courses with a bearded dragon, with fish tanks, um, with gerbils, with hamsters, with rabbits, um, other classrooms with classroom pets tend to do better in terms of their performance in the classroom. And here's how I justify it, is that it generates this form of student camaraderie. It also motivates the students to come to class. They want to check up on their leopard gecko. They want to check up on their rabbit that they have been, um, you know, is seen since day one of the classroom, right? And it also generates the student excitement to go to the classroom on a daily basis oftentimes before or after school where they will stay um, to play with this pet, to, to uh, take care of this animal. It not only fosters a sense of, of uh, collaboration, it not only fosters a sense of, of effective learning, but it also just generates the fact that our students are effectively able to come to school every day and they are excited to come to the school to see their pet specifically. Uh, so it's very cool. As well, in the classroom, it is very visually appealing um, to have a pet in the classroom. So if students are looking to take a quick break from something, this is what they are doing. And it's very cool. It would also be a, specifically for the leopard gecko. It is a very low maintenance animal. Uh, it only needs to be fed once every week to two weeks, which is effective. Um, and every once in a while, the tank needs to be cleaned out. No big deal. And in the summertime, it can either be left at school or it could even be taken home, which is effective too. As well as, like I said, it is not a science experiment, but rather it is a classroom pet. It is designed to be treated with care, love, and respect, um, just as any pet at home would be. Um, and I think this is a great way to foster that as well. So in summary and, and in my conclusion, the way I see student learning is uh, uh, how we are going to affect the 21st century. The way that we are teaching right now is changing. I will admit that. I will be the first to admit that. However, we are not hitting that benchmark and hitting the needs for student learning. Um, it's kind of like having a car and um, not having heated seats in it. Most of the time now, heated seats are a standard in a car, right? It's the same thing with the classroom. Um, we are not hitting those benchmarks. Like heated seats, um, we are not conducing to the consumer. And when you look at it from a business perspective, if we are in a classroom, um, are we hitting the benchmark in terms of our student learning? And the answer to that to me is no. Um, plain and simply. And it, it, the reason why is we are behind in that student factor. Um, our students are ever evolving. Uh, they crave relationships. They crave the aspect of student-centered learning. They want to take power for themselves. They have this leadership. They have the technology on their side. They have the resources they need. All we need to do as teachers is get out of the mentality of being uh, authoritarians of being um, leaders, you know, and we need to relate upon their level, act as a coach for them, um, advise them, be effective leaders for them instead of being instructors uh, who commands information. Thank you very much for listening to my video. I hope I hear some good feedback on this. Um, if you have anything else to talk to me about, I sure, sure welcome you to do that. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon or day. Hmm. <laughs>